Welcome back to our continuing, well, we could say archaeological adventure through the Gospel of Matthew. Think here, for example, what archaeologists do. They approach a site, they begin to dig, and as they go through that site and dig, they try to reconstruct what has since passed. They find artifacts that provide them clues and context for what the people were like and what the people did. If you don't push it too far, in a sense, as we try to work, especially through this portion of the Gospel of Matthew, the trial of Jesus, we have tried to go step back in time and through some of the artifacts begin to reconstruct what was going on, what was happening. Understand, much like an archaeologist, there are no records for some of what we're saying. What was Caiaphas really like? What was Caiaphas doing with his henchmen? We don't know much about Pilate in terms of background, future. There's some of the stuff, Barabbas, etc. But like good archaeologists, we're trying to make solid conclusions based on the artifacts we see and to, in that sense, minimize speculation for the sake of speculation. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 24. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the people. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. The New International Version, Matthew chapter 27 and verse 24. We can put what happened in the trial of Jesus in a legal framework. Now, understand, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a judge, so this is a popular take on the legal system. And, of course, I'm generalizing. I've obviously seen way too many American crime shows and probably have, you know, a, a hybrid sort of idea of legal system from Canadian and American television. In the committing of a crime, it is not always the case that a person who did not commit the crime is innocent. In certain cases, people could be considered complicit for they knew what was going to be done in advance, but ignored what was going on around them. So there are cases where people, you know, aided and abetted a criminal. And a crime gets committed. They had a complicit involvement because they did not step in beforehand. Or think of the case of an armed robbery. Say a two or a team of two or three go into a bank to rob it. They have guns, they have their weapons, and they are ready to do what needs to be done to get the money. The one person keeps his gun unfired. One of his accomplices in and through the act of that robbery murders a bank teller. A horrific event. Now, the person who did not fire the gun can still be considered uh, complicit in the crime because they were involved within that armed robbery. In other words, their involvement in that armed robbery makes them, in that sense, as guilty in the murder of that individual as the person who fired the weapon. What we are getting at here is that the law and law codes, generally speaking, and I'm obviously making generalizations, does not necessarily equate guilt with the actual perpetuation of an act. You will see guilt in a broad sense may come down to the unwillingness to stop what came to pass, what came to be. Pilate had lost the day. He did not see the need to crucify Jesus. Now, on the one hand, he was trying to work against the religious leaders led by Caiaphas. In that sense, we have to understand some of what Pilate was doing was not anything to deal, do with or anything about Jesus or to deal with what Jesus was about. In the practice of statecraft, he, that is Pilate, was trying to be the one in control. In the end, he was outmaneuvered by Caiaphas and his henchmen. Then there was a note he received from his wife, which was not to condemn this man. 
This only reiterated the doubts he had. Then there was the person of Jesus. In other words, his reticence to condemn Jesus was not, I don't think, necessarily centered on who Jesus was or exclusively on who Jesus was. There's not much doubt when you look at all the gospel accounts dealing with Pilate that a picture emerges in which Pilate was impressed by what he saw in Jesus. The problem was not that was that was not enough to make him go against what he was about. In other words, for Pilate, one more body under his administration was not going to make much difference to him. Pilate, at the end of the day, had a job to do, and if it meant crucifying the Son of God, so be it. Now, obviously, I'm not saying he understood that Jesus was God in the flesh, the full Son of God, so on and so forth. But that begs the issue, because at the end of the day, Pilate did what he had to do, and it wouldn't make any difference who Jesus really was. Pilate, in this passage, is a has this dramatic image preserved of him, washing his hands, seeking to absolve his guilt. Now, did Pilate absolve himself of guilt? The answer is, of course, no. We understand, even in our legal system, that guilt in a crime has come in the form of not doing what was in his power to stop from what was, was about to come to pass. Pilate was hiding his responsibility to Jesus behind the legalities of Roman rule. His hands were tied. The people had spoken. You see, Pilate is not the first nor the last to confuse what is allowed with what is right. Did you catch that? He's not the first nor the last to confuse with what, with what is allowed with what is right. Something can be allowed, but that does not make it right. Evil in all its forms is not always about the perpetuators of that evil, but it is, at times it's about those who could do something and chose to do nothing. I think here that famous line from that classic 1960s uh, television series, Hogan Hero, Hero, Hogan's Heroes, I see nothing, I hear nothing, I'm one of the guards within the prison camp. Always, I see nothing, I hear nothing. We could say that Pilate had the possibility to not have Jesus crucified, the problem, of course, is that Pilate was not really free to do that. I do not mean in the sense that by the nature of the job, he could not. I mean that Pilate, in a way, had already determined to crucify the Son of God long before Jesus appeared before him. Pilate was a career Roman bureaucrat. Pilate was a man who benefited by having position and power. It is easy to romanticize Pilate's encounter with Jesus, but understand through a long career, Pilate firmly planted his feet in this world and its values. You see, Pilate, in ways I cannot tell you, had before this day made it impossible for him to set Jesus free. In other words, Pilate had so encased himself in the values of this world, he found himself on this day not free to do what was right and good. The reality is that day by day and moment by moment, we are by our choices making who we are, who we become. No one in that sense is free from those multitude of choices that we make over a lifetime that shape, define, and create who we are. Understand, while it is not impossible for a person to make a deathbed conversion to Jesus, a life that has been lived apart from God makes it very difficult, even at the final moments as a person takes their final breath, to choose Jesus. Not impossible, but very difficult to do that. 